Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Take your Bible, if you will, and look with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17. Luke, chapter 17. And I've entitled the message this morning, Do You Have a Thankful Heart? Do you have a thankful heart? In the year 1623, William Bradford, uh, he was the governor of one of the colonies, got people together and established the very first Thanksgiving. And uh, in his remarks before the meal that day, he made this statement, and I quote, <clears throat> in a description of uh, why he was doing what he was doing, he says, for rendering Thanksgiving to the Almighty God for all his blessings. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln declared a national holiday for Thanksgiving. But it's amazing today when you look around how little focus now is given uh, on how blessed we are as a nation. Uh, we, we don't focus in on that. We, we have become institutionalized. We have become internalized. Uh, we um, have got our attention on each other and we're pointing out the flaws of everybody else and ignoring the flaws of our own life. We're saying, you'll never get what's mine and I'm gonna take what's yours before it's over with. And we're internally fighting and have lost complete focus on what is important and how blessed we are from God as a nation. I watch uh, funeral after funeral when they do the military rites and they'll bring that flag and they'll give it to the recipient of the flag and they'll say, on behalf of a grateful nation. Well, frankly, folks, we're no longer a grateful nation. Our attention is not on our blesser anymore. I want you to stand with me and let's read. I, I've chosen this passage this morning in Luke 17, beginning in verse 11. I believe it's a powerful illustration of where we need to be as a people. Look with me, if you will, beginning in verse 11. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Now that's important that you, you get where this is going. He was going to Jerusalem, but he went through Samaria and then to Galilee to get there. And he entered into a certain village. <clears throat> there met him 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, and you've got to put the inflection here of where it really is because, you know, they were way off from Jesus. And so they shout, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And they shouted it as loud as they could. And when he saw them, he said unto them, go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, very important, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, one of them, one of them, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And he fell down on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. He was a Samaritan. Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? They're not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. Powerful words. He said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word today. And, and, and Lord, as we extrapolate some truths out of your word this morning, I pray that, Lord, hearts and minds would be renewed to the point, God, that we would be more thankful to you than we've ever been before for all things that you have done and who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, the first thing I want you to see with me this morning is the fact that Jesus has a thankful heart. He has a thankful heart. And, and, and I could choose four real passages of Scripture out of the Gospels to prove that point. One of them being when Jesus fed the 5,000 over there in John chapter 6, uh, you remember that he and the disciples and a multitude of people, uh, 5,000 men besides the women and children, in all probability there's about 15,000 uh, that were out there in the wilderness hungry. 
they found a few barley loaves and some fish. And what did Jesus do? He got that. And what did he do? He thanked God for the food. I, I think too in Luke, uh, in, in Luke 10, 21, uh, when the 72 disciples uh, came back from an evangelism outing where they had been witnessing and telling people about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, they came back. And what did Jesus do when they returned? He offered up thanks to God for the freedom of the gospel and to be able to preach and to extend the good news. And then, of course, in uh, John chapter 11, one of my favorite passages in all of the Bible, when uh, you know Jesus had waited until Lazarus had been dead about four days, he shows up to Bethany, and he's standing outside the tomb of Lazarus. And here's what he said. He said, Lord, I thank you that you've always heard me. And I thank you that it's no different now. You're hearing me now. And so he then went on to say, Lazarus, come on out of there, loose him and let him go. And then of course in Mark chapter 14, uh, when they were gathered in that upper room and the disciples were there and Jesus looks out across the disciples and he said, hey guys, I really hate to tell you this, but uh, one of you are going to betray me. Boy, they got to bouncing it back and forth. Is it me? Is it me? Am I going to be the one to do that? And then Jesus having that thankful heart, he took the bread and the wine and he thanked God for his provision. Jesus has a thankful heart. You say, well, what's the world's that got to do uh, with this passage? Well, if you notice, the Bible says he's going to Jerusalem, but the route that he took was not one of the two main routes that led to the city. As a matter of fact, you could possibly have reversed this and had been a lot closer uh, to the route than the one that he took. He goes through Samaria before he goes through Galilee, which should have been just the opposite to get to his destination. But the fact is, because of that thankful heart of gratitude, he was always looking to meet the needs of others. So he had a divine appointment with 10 lepers over there in Samaria that no Jew would have ever gone to meet. He goes to meet that need. He comes across these lepers, 10 of them, in fact, and they encounter him. He encounters them. They were considered to be unholy. They were considered to be unclean. They couldn't get anywhere near him physically. According to the Levitical law, they were not allowed to get very close. But Jesus goes into Samaria because there were some needs to be met and he goes there with that thankful heart, knowing in advance that thankfulness would abound when he would meet that need. You know, that fact of the matter is, there are needs all around this ministry. There are needs all around where you live. Uh, you don't have to look very long. And I'm wondering if we wouldn't have done something this morning. You know, last week I talked about uh, having one of those monitors that would uh, check uh, to see if we were apostates, you know, like they uh, do over at the airport. And, and you walk through that screen and that screening shows if you've got any metal uh, around in there. I, I wonder if we wouldn't have those screens this morning, except it would be an EKG screen. And that we would give you an EKG of your heart before you came in. I wonder what your heart would reveal. Would it reveal that you have a heart of gratitude or would it reveal that you are a heart full of selfishness? Take an EKG this morning of the needs that are around you. And I think about all of the excuses that people use to keep from meeting the needs that God exposes to people. They, they, they go in and say, you know what? I, I'm not going to deal with those people. Those people are never going to change. They're never going to be any different. I am just would waste my time because it would not have any good result at all. And they'll use that as an excuse. Or they will say, you know what? Uh, that, that's too risky for me. Uh, I'm afraid if I get involved in something like that, it would cost me more than I'm willing to pay. And that's too big of a risk for me to launch into, so I'm just going to avoid that. Or maybe it's the excuse of, well, I'm just not gifted in that area. Somebody else would be much better at that than I would be at that. And so they refuse 
to get involved. You know, one of the things that we could do this morning on the Sunday before Thanksgiving is why not remember all that God has done for you and just come to the conclusion that no one out there is beyond the boundary of the love of God. And a guy came up to me between services a few minutes ago and he was so touched by this first point in the message that he said, you know what, Pastor, I pass by homeless people every day of my life and I've never done anything about it. But he said, you know what I've determined? I've determined that I'm gonna start buying one sleeping bag every payday that I have coming. I wanna be involved. So, so you see that Jesus has a thankful heart. He, he's meeting another need in somebody's life. Now, what's the second thing? You understand that the lepers had some element of faith that Jesus could do something about their plight. They had faith to believe that Jesus could change their situation, their circumstance. Now, notice what the Bible says that as he came into a certain village, that these 10 lepers stood afar off and they shouted out loud, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Have you, ever, have you ever even asked the question when reading that passage, have you ever just considered what made them think that Jesus could do anything about it? What made them have the idea that Jesus could fix their situation? I asked that question until I looked back over at Luke 5 and Jesus was enlisting disciples to come uh, around him and the Bible says that he came across this leper. And in that encounter, the Bible says that Jesus touched him and cleansed him of his leprosy. And when he finished cleansing him of his leprosy, he said, now, I don't want you to tell anybody what's going on here today. Just keep this between me and you. Just be quiet about it. But the very next verse the Bible says that the reputation and the fame of Jesus spread everywhere. So I suspect that that news went from leper colony to leper colony to leper colony about this leper that Jesus had not just said be healed, he touched him and he was healed. And these lepers were thinking, you know what? If he did that for him, he certainly could do it for us. And so they had that faith in them that God could change them, that Jesus could heal them of this horrible disease, this death sentence. By the way, leprosy was a death sentence. They, 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 they would come along and say, I'm never going to see my family again. I can't live with them. I'm ostracized now into a leper colony with other people that have the same disease that I have. I'll never see my kids grow up. I'll never get to walk my daughter down the aisle. Oh, I heard this about Jesus. <laughs> and it gives me hope. He can do something about my situation. Now, Jesus didn't do the same thing that he had done in Luke 5. But what he did do, he said, go show yourself to the priest. Now, I found this to be extremely important. I found it to be interesting because the only reason that you would go show yourself to the priest would be because you're healed, that you were already cleansed. You go down there with the leprosy, show yourself to the priest, he's just gonna make your situation much more worse. But the Bible says that's where they headed out. They're gonna obey Jesus. They're gonna do what Jesus told them to do. And as they were going, can you picture this in your mind for a minute? As they were going, they looked at one another and is something happening to you. The, the leprosy's fading. It's, it's going away. Your skin's looking newer and fresher and alive. They got to looking at each other and themselves and suddenly realized they were cleansed. That God had made a difference. Now, here's the deal. They came to Jesus. They had faith and they said, have mercy. They asked of God 
to change their situation. They asked for relief. They asked for healing. And then they obeyed what God told them to do. And as they were going, they were healed. And the miracle took place. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6, the Bible says, be anxious Listen, listen, those of you that are facing insurmountable obstacles, those of you that seemingly have a death sentence on your life, those of you that are facing some things that are beyond your control, that if God doesn't come through, you're sunk. Listen, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. What is this about thanksgiving? He said, you come to me with a heart of thanksgiving, you come to me with a heart of gratitude, and you make your requests known, and then you do what I tell you to do, then you can expect the miracle to take place. There are two things that are gonna happen. When you come to God with thanksgiving, when you pray and you seek him, one of two things is going to happen. You ready for this? Listen. Your circumstances are going to change or God is going to give you peace and understanding in the midst of it. You can count on it. Do you, do you remember, and it would pay us to remember, hearing the gospel never saved anyone? You understand that faith must be followed by commitment. Because a man believes, he acts, and he, in that intelligent response to what God has already declared to be true, then the healing power of God does what needs to be done. Let me give you number three. You ready for it? I love this. I love this third point. I ought to really just probably wrap a sermon around just the one point. The giver became more important than the gift. The giver became more important than the gift. How, how many people, how many lepers showed up? How many did God heal? How many returned to give God glory? Why? You picture this same dude as he's walking with the others and he, he, he looks at the miracle that has occurred in his body and he simply responded, I got to get back to God. I got to give him thanks. I got to give my gratitude. I got to tell him what this means to me. I got to glorify God for this. And so he turns around and the giver became more important than the gift. How many of you have ever made this statement? Um, it's not the gift that counts, but it's the thought that counts. How many of you have ever made that statement? Oh, yeah, it's the thought that, that, that counts. Do you know this? Listen to this statement. No matter the value of the gift, the value of knowing that someone thought enough about you to give you the gift is a whole lot more valuable than what they gave you. Some of you know a couple of weeks ago I had surgery. Most of you didn't have a clue because I was back in the pulpit and preached like a crazy man last Sunday and my wife beat me half to death when I got home, but that was okay. But while I was laid up, uh, I, I got home um, from the doctor and uh, on my front porch was this humongous basket and it was filled with stuff. It was filled with my favorite water um, I, I don't drink regular water much. I, I drink uh, Perrier or Pellegrino or something like that. I just, I love that water. And, and it, it had a bunch of that. It had my favorite soda in there. Diet, caffeine-free, Coca-Cola. It had a bunch of that in there. There was my favorite breath mints. And, and, and I don't know how they knew all of that stuff, but it was packed full of my favorite things. And, and somebody took a, a lot of painstaking thought and and, and, and put it all together. It wasn't just 
happened, wasn't just haphazardly done. You could tell it was good. But over in the corner was a card. And it was handwritten. And this little kid about that high had taken the time with a crayon and wrote me a card. Pastor, I love you. And I pray God heals you. I love to hear you preach. I bawled like a baby. You know why? Suddenly, the giver became a whole lot more important than the gift. Every gift has a giver. Never lose sight of the giver. James 1.17 said, Every good and perfect gift comes from God. It's ours. I just get to thinking, though. Just in, just in God's economy, I get to thinking how important, how valuable we must be to God. Why do you say that, Pastor? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should never perish but have everlasting life. You know, that makes us pretty important. The giver is always greater than the gift. Let, let me give you the fourth one and we'll shut her down with this one. It's a silly little point, but it drives home the point. God shovels in, we shovel out, and God's got a bigger shovel. How many people were healed? Ten of them. All of them received the unmerited favor of God. But did you notice that the Bible says, and he was a Samaritan. Obviously, in the mixture of those ten, there had to have been some Jews along with this Samaritan. Now, wouldn't you have thought, I would have, wouldn't you have thought that the logical one who would have returned to give God thanks would have been the Jew who knew more about God than the Samaritan. The Samaritan who knew less about God was the one who returned. To give God thanks. Now, did the nine miss out? This old boy comes back. He worships Jesus. He prays God. He glorifies God. He's the only one. What about the nine? Did they really miss out? If they were all healed. Were they physically healed? Yes. Were they spiritually healed? Was there lack of of gratitude, was their lack of praise, was their lack of thanksgiving indicative of an unbelieving heart? Well, I know this. If your life has been drastically, dramatically, glorifyingly changed by the power of God, you will have a heart of gratitude and thanks. You will. Now, this one man, Jesus looks down at this Samaritan and he says, your faith hath made you whole. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. They were just cleansed while they were walking. What does he mean, your faith hath made you whole? Now, I have a little bit of a sanctified imagination about stuff. And, and I believe that this means two things. I really do. I, I believe that this old boy, when he was down there on his face praising God, Jesus says, get up now. Your faith has made you whole. I believe that some miracles started taking place right now. I, I believe that he looked down at his fingers and that finger that had rotted off to the very bone itself, I believe was restored. I believe when he looked down and the appendages of his feet had rotted off to the very ground itself. I believe that they grew back. I believe that his own nose that had rotted off and the pus was oozing out, all of a sudden he feels, and my nose is back. 
Your faith has made you whole. But I also believe that he was cleansed of his sin. When you display a heart of thanksgiving, when you display a heart of gratitude, when you praise God for who he is and what he's done, when you come to the place that you acknowledge him as the giver, what happens? God gives you more to be grateful for. God gives you more to be thankful for. There are three questions here that really evolve. Two is asked and one is implied. Where are the nine? So I ask you this question. They didn't come back. They didn't thank God. They'd been healed of their leprosy. But they didn't thank God for it. Has God provided for you? Come on. Has he protected you? Has he loved you? Where, where, where are the nine? Why weren't they faithful to praise? So do you, do, you, do you praise God for his faithfulness? Do you praise him for his provisions? Do you praise him for his protection? Do you praise him for the fact that he cared about you and loved you? Do you give him credit for what he does in your heart and your life? And then the implication of this third question is, you know, how come it's just this foreigner here? How come it's just this foreigner who is the only one that has returned? I, here's the deal. Before Christ, we were all aliens. Before Christ, we were all foreigners. Before Christ, we were all alienated from God due to our sin. But Christ through his shed blood, reconciles us to God. And we're no longer foreigners, but we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We are children, heirs and joint heirs of Jesus. A life of gratitude beats with a heart of thanksgiving. I uh, found out about a dear friend of mine who used to be a deacon here, has now been serving God as a pastor for a number of years. Found out he was gravely ill. I called him the latter part of the week and uh, checking on him. And he said, well, I see you have found out. I said, yeah, I, I, I found out. I said, what's going on? He said, well, pastor, and he still calls me after all these years, he still calls me pastor. He says, pastor, I have stage four lung cancer. And the doctor sat across from me and he says to me, your lymph nodes are swollen all over your body. You have stage four lung cancer and you have about a year to live. And the doctor says, what's wrong with you? Did you not hear me? And he said, yeah, I heard you. He said, is that the reaction that you're going to get? That's the strangest reaction I, I've ever heard. What, what kind of reaction is this? He said, well, Doc, I can't thank God enough for what he's done for me. And he said, I've been preaching the goodness and the greatness of God all my ministry. And he said, how can I not live it? And I refuse to get in a pulpit and preach what I don't live. I am grateful to God. And as long as God gives me breath, I'm going to keep preaching his word. And it's God who determines the length of my life, not this cancer. Well, what a thankful heart. Do you have a thankful heart? Are you grateful for who he is and for what he's done in your life? Would you stand with me and let's pray together.
heads bowed, eyes are closed for just a few minutes. I wonder how many of you are facing what you consider to be an insurmountable obstacle in your life. I wonder how many of you are facing some barrier that you're thinking, you know what, if God doesn't come through, I'm just not going to make it through this. It may be in your family, it may be in your finances, it may be your job, it may be your health. But I wonder how many of you could do what Philippians says with thanksgiving for who God is and for all that he's done. Bring that need to Jesus today. Say, you know what, Lord? I'm so thankful for who you are. I'm so thankful for what you've done in my life. I'm so thankful that you've saved my soul. I'm so thankful that I'm going to go to heaven one of these days. And Lord, between now and then, I got a tough thing I'm facing here that I really need for you to come on the scene with and obey him. And then watch the miracle take place. So I invite you to come to this altar. Pour your heart out to God. Some of you are here this morning, you need to be saved. Your sin has alienated you from God. And the only remedy for your sin is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And you need to come this morning and receive Christ Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. Allow me the opportunity to pray with you while you do that. Some of you need to join this church. Your membership is somewhere else and the Holy Spirit of God has revealed to you that this is the place where you need to serve. I invite you to come. Father, may your will be done in every heart and every life that is here. God, I pray that you'd get glory in this invitation. May lives be changed. May needs be met as they and us give you praise and glory and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.